Hey, y'all. Welcome back to another episode of the Pertinier Outdoors podcast. Billy here. We are episode 167, and this week we got a little uh, small business review, uh, which is something I want to start doing, is kind of segmenting the show a little bit to have uh, you know what you're tuning in for. So this is going to be a SBR small business review with uh, our friend Ron Green over at Entertech Labs. So enjoy this discussion. We're going to dive right into it with, with Ron hear a little bit about his product, uh, what it does, and why you should think about purchasing it. Thank you for listening. Bait him. Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah. that's your yeah. name. Squirrel's got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think of that of it, because that's what deer hunting typically <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass, and I see these deer moving. I'm like, ooh, there's deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass, wearing shorts and a T-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that tarred? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's when you're the 275 ghost pounds, I don't know how you do that, but the Freightliner. <laughs> it's just like a creeper. Just kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know? He's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping it, kissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. What did you say his name? Her- Herve Velichos. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Pertinier means? If you know what Pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. <laughs> Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast, brought to you by Pertnier Outdoors. It's that time of year. It's that time of year where we all need to be thinking about, do we have everything we need to hit the woods? Chances are you don't, and if you think you do, you probably could use some more. So how about you go over to thehuntworks.com and check out all the incredible products these guys are carrying. Uh, This is a great family, local store. Uh, Dan and Steve Dunnigan, a couple hardworking some bitches. They are now carrying archery equipment, everything from bows to arrows to broadheads, quivers, you name it. So on top of all the great tree stands and box blinds that they're carrying, they're now a full, full-on full archery dealer and really recommend that you check these guys out for your next big purchase. Uh, head over to thehuntworks.com to see what they've got for sale. Or if you're local in the Rochester area, head on over to their store in East Rochester on Despatch Drive and check them out. They are on social media, The Hunt Works, and also online, like I said. And if you purchase anything online, you can use promo code FEEDNEM to get 5% off. And that's F-E-E-D, FEEDN, I-N-U-M, 5% off. Feed them. Ron Green. Billy. Can you hear me? I can. Wow. Technology, huh? That was an adventure. Yeah. It's uh sometimes it makes you frustrated, but you just gotta roll with it. It's the it's the world we live in today. It's stuff's yes, supposed sir. to work and it doesn't work and you just gotta figure it out. So I'm excited to have this conversation today. We've been talking about doing this for quite a while. We've known each other for I was thinking about this morning, it's probably been ten years, I bet. Maybe if not even, more. If yeah. not more, yeah. So you, uh, let's give a have you give a quick introduction of who you are, um, and uh, and what the company is that you are the owner of. Okay. Well, I'm the owner of a company called Entertech Labs. It's been around since 2004, and we specialize in diesel and gasoline additives. So all things fuel related, uh, heating oil, uh, anything that has to do with petroleum. So. Uh, Billy and I had met back when I was dealing with school buses and hard parts, engine parts, and that kind of thing, and uh, was able to switch gears a little bit and start working for a chemical company that uh, was fixing engine problems. So my background was dealing with uh, with all the engines and all the school buses and all fleets and municipalities around North America, and they have tremendous engine problems on the diesel side and gasoline side. We found out it's fuel related. So if we boost the fuel and get it to run, uh, you know, bring the fuel back up to a premium diesel or a premium gasoline, the engines run so much better. People stop yelling at me, stop saying these these things. Are, you know, I can't depend on my diesel, uh, and 
got an opportunity to work for the company and help promote that around the country. And that really is, uh, has been how I got involved in it. And eventually I liked it so much I bought the company. So that's where I am. That was probably the elevator speech because I'm sure there's a lot more to it, but that's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool how in life you cross paths with people and you and I, you know, we were going to mechanics expos and, you know, trade shows and stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were always kind of cohorts, but then really over the last few years, we kind of started making a connection on our, both of our passions for the outdoors and, and what we share there. And, uh, and that has kind of become a new connection for you and I, and a new kind of a new business area that you're getting into, which is working with a lot of guys that have boats in particular. And you and I connect, right. you and I connected with, uh, you came out to, sh- to the shed fest event we had and you met, uh, Jim and a bunch of the other captains that came there from South town walleyes. And, uh, that kind of connected you with that group. And, uh, what I really wanted to dive into today, I mean, obviously we've got a lot going on, uh, geopolitically and a lot going on with oil and fuel. And so things are, things are changing. There's challenges, uh, that, that nobody maybe knows more about as far as the, the changes on a day to day. Um, I shouldn't say maybe you don't know more about, but you're, you're very in tune with what's going on, uh, with the quality of fuel out there. And I know it's a, it's a talking point that I hear all the time in the diesel engine world, uh, with our, my career in the school bus industry. But, uh, but I want to kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what is going on with fuel today and, you know, we'll kind of talk about the fuel end, but then talk about, um, you know, why the additives are important and what the purpose is of them. Because I think we've all seen an additive. You go to the gas station, there's, you know, you got some of the big name brands that are sitting there on the shelf, but it's like, well, what are those do? Is it snake oil or is it really doing something? So I, I guess, I don't know what you think would be the best place to start. Would it be best to talk a little bit about what a fuel additive does? And then we can maybe talk about what's going on with the fuel today and why it's important to use it. Or do you, should we put the egg before the chicken or the chicken before the egg? What do you think? <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about the fuel itself. I think that's an important thing to say. You know, it, the gas, let's just start with gasoline because everybody has some sort of small engine, especially in the hunting world. We've got ATVs. We've got, you know, certainly boats and jet skis and all of that. Um, gasoline that's available today is not our grandfather's or even our gasoline from years ago when we were kids, right? So uh, there's an introduction to et- with ethanol in the recent years, and I mean recent years in the last 20 years, I guess, right? But uh, ethanol was introduced because it's an oxygen in the gasoline. So back in the you know, 50s, 60s, there was naturally aspirated engines. And the, in other words, they had carburetors, right? They suck air in from the outside, and that engine would run. Um, and, you know, constantly tweaking and adjusting that. And um, then they put catalytic converters on those engines catalytic converters on those engines are to burn any excess fuel that's coming down the exhaust. I mean, my, my old race car, if I really hopped on it, I could smell fuel, right? Gas, unburned gas. That piston burns most of the gasoline, but not all of it. So, but if you remember, they were gas guzzlers. So what happened was they said, listen, we, we're going to, we've got fuel and we've had heat going down this exhaust. The catalytic converter really uh, uses heat in this chemical reaction that happens with some of the things in the catalytic converter, rare earth metals, they amplify temperature to burn off that extra fuel. Well, you need oxygen to do that. So they put an oxygen in, in it called MTBE, and of course, lo and behold, that causes cancer. Hmm. So um, they said, uh, you know, and, and if you're putting something that when you burn it releases oxygen down the exhaust, it's sort of like breathing on that catalytic converter to help that oxygen to burn off all that fuel, right? You need fuel, heat, and oxygen to burn something, right? To blow on the fire. So that's what that stuff did originally. Now, in that engine, put an O2 sensor on the exhaust and a computer in it, and that computer will sniff on the exhaust to see how much oxygen is coming down that exhaust, tell the fuel control module how much fuel to inject into that engine. Now we have electronic fuel ignition, right, EFI engines. That's what all the newer engines are, where it's constantly sniffing at the exhaust, making the for, the uh, fuel ratio a little rich, a little lean, a little rich, a little lean, really fine-tuning that engine. Now we have much better fuel economy, a more reliable engine. We're not trying to stick pencils in the carburetor on a cold day to try to get the thing running, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's what happened. So they, they came in and said, listen, we've got this stuff called ethanol. 
When you burn that, it releases oxygen down the exhaust, and we can make it out of corn. Now it's a renewable resource, so let's put that in, get rid of MTBE, which causes cancer. Um, everything's good. Well, not true. Not true. Ethanol in its is an alcohol. It's made from grain. It's, it's basically moonshine that they put a, a product in there to make it so you can't drink it, right? It's just too terrible to drink, but literally it's moonshine. So we put that in our in our fuel. It will burn 10% the perfect mix. O2 sensors will still sniff at it and say, hey, we can still run your engine. Everything's great. Perfect. Fuel coming through the pipeline, fuel getting to its first destination, no problem. It's all dry, clean, good fuel. So it also boosts the octane a tremendous amount. So now the fuel companies can make a poorer grade gasoline, add a little ethanol, get it boost the octane up high, so all is well. So here's the problem. Ethanol loves water. It absorbs water. It'll hold up to five gallons per thousand of water. That's a tremendous amount of water, four to six ounces in your gas tank before you see it, before it looks hazy and cloudy. So that's a problem. So it's enough to cause corrosion. It's enough to cause engines to run funny. Uh, Water certainly doesn't like to burn. Water droplets are a lot bigger, so you'll get on a cold morning, you'll get a, uh, a rough-running, misfiring engine in your car, and then after, as it warms up, it runs a little better. Um, the biggest, biggest problem is when you get to the threshold where it can't hold any water anymore. Ethanol and gasoline kind of float together, but they're not chemically connected. So when alcohol grabs onto the water, it'll get to the point where the water wants to fall to the bottom. It's a heavier, water is heavier than gasoline or ethanol. So it pulls the water out with it. The water falls to the bottom, sorry, it pulls the ethanol out with it. So instead of having 10% ethanol, the gasoline that's left at the top is maybe 4% ethanol, 5% ethanol. Now, as I explain what that does to your engine, now all of a sudden your engine doesn't see 10 at the exhaust, it sees 4 or 5. So it wonders, hmm, I have too much, I have too little oxygen. I've got to add more fuel, right? Or I've, I've got to actually do the opposite. I've got to lean that motor out a little bit. So if it happens to burn that water and ethanol at the bottom, you'll get the engine will trigger a lean code and it'll flood the motor. It'll say, I've got too much oxygen. I need more fuel. So we end up with problems with runnability issues in engines. If you burn the phase separated ethanol and water at the bottom, it'll run really funny. But more importantly, it'll flood your motor and it can melt your catalytic converter. Remember, that catalytic converter at the end is a big oven and all it does is burn the excess fuel, right? So if you have a ton of oxygen and a ton of fuel and a ton of heat, it's going to glow cherry red, all right? I had a fleet of sheriff's cars. I got a little sample of fuel that got sent mailed to me. They found me on the internet, sent me a little sample, have an ethanol tester. And all it said was a business card was, what's wrong with my car? And I measured the ethanol content. It said 17.5%. And I called the guy back and said, you melted your catalytic converter. He said, wrong. I melted 37 of them. Holy shit. Yeah. So the gas station across the street had a little water intrusion, you know, a rainy day. Someone didn't put the cap on right. Uh, Underground water got in, started phase separation, ruined his fleet, cost him $47,000. And repairs so this is what's going on so i know that's a long drawn out story well no but the problem is go ahead you're hitting on so my mind is is turning on on challenges we've had over the last few years with our we sell a gasoline engine in the bus and uh one of the biggest issues that we've had has been rough starting uh especially on Mm -hmm. days not necessarily super cold but where you'll have a big change in the ambient temperature where you'll have in the day, the day before, it'll be, you know, 80 degrees, and then it'll drop down to 50, 60 degrees at night, and you'll get a lot, you'll, it'll be one of those mornings with a lot of dew and condensation, and districts will go out there and they'll go to fire their buses up, and they're just tripping and spitting and sputtering all over the place. Sometimes we'll get a, we'll get an engine code for a fuel trim that's off, but oftentimes it'll just, it just runs rough, and we've even had them stall. The, the, the engine will just stall right mm-hmm. out, but then once it gets up and running, it's fine. So, Right. I don't know. Have you, have you, I mean, 
you know, obviously you work with school districts, you're in the industry. Have you had any discussions with anybody about that issue in particular on the, on, yeah, on the bus spelling, side? I'm spelling gas RX just fleets now okay. that are fixing that problem. In fact, uh, Akron schools was the school that I fixed the first 10,000 gallons of base separated ethanol. Okay. Joe, Joe Aspect called me. He said, I'm going on vacation to Maine and, uh, I need you to check my gas tank, you know, my, my fuel tank. So to- typically I go out, I have a sample tool. I drop to the bottom of this big 10,000 underground tank and I check, make sure there's no water and bacteria. Just, just check the fuel ability, you know, make sure it's all good before he goes off into the middle of nowhere. So I, for, you know, for a goof, I checked the gasoline and he had just gotten his delivery of gasoline, his first ethanol delivery. So when it went from MTB to, uh, to ethanol, uh, I said, Joe, did you pump all the water off the bottom? He said, no, why would I do that? I said, how much water do you have down there? He said, about a quarter inch, according to the Vita root system, a little electronic system that tells you water content and how much the fuel level. So I check it. He's fully phase separated. I said, shut down the pumps. You're going to have big problems. So he was panicking, and, and it was only a quarter inch of water, but I checked it out, and it was phasing out at the time. Uh, so the bottom line is if it's 10,000 gallons and it's 10% ethanol, right? That means 1,000 gallons of ethanol and 9,000 gallons of fuel. That's what that means. When you see E10, E15, E85, that's the percentage of ethanol that's in the gasoline, and the remaining is is gasoline. So E85 is 85% ethanol, 15% gas, just so you guys know. Um, and uh, so, so I ended up checking it out with Joe, and I said, listen, I know our product breaks water down chemically. This is what it does. And this is what makes it different from every other additive out there. So I poured in the amount that I needed, uh, probably about 20, I think we put in 24 gallons of, of, of product, and it reversed the phase separation and fixed the whole tank, and he went off on vacation, and all was good. Hmm. So since that point, I've fixed probably – 150 gas stations uh, in fuel tanks like that at between 3,000 to 10,000 gallons of gas. So it's very simple, actually. If you pump the water and the bad ethanol off the bottom and measure the amount of ethanol in there, just treat it to break the water down and add more ethanol, in, and that fixes it. So um, refineries will tell you you can't fix it. So I go to customers, and they say, you know, it's $80,000 to throw away 10,000 gallons of gas, clean the tank and refill it. I fix it for, you know, 1800 bucks. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, they get pretty happy about that. It just on the cheek for that one. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and I've, I've seen it on my, I was talking to my, telling my dad about, we were going to get together and have this discussion today. And I, I think my dad may have used some of your product at HFL, I believe. Um, but I was telling him, I was like, I, I've, I've been using the gas RX for probably three, four years now. Um, and especially of late, I've been adamant about using it in my, because of discussions with you and everything that's happening with the fuel. Uh, I've been using it for all of my lawnmower, four wheeler, uh, right. pressure washer, that sort of stuff. And this spring I pulled my pressure washer out of the shed and I bought it last mm-hmm. year. So it's a brand new pressure washer and I'm sitting there just cranking on it. And I cannot get the damn thing to start. I was so frustrated and, uh, I figured it was a fuel issue so I, I took a little bit of the, of the gas RX and I dumped it in the fuel uh, fuel tank, gave it 10 minutes, and then came back through, you know, reprimed it, choked it, and got it going, and, and it, it started up like third pole. Uh, so yeah. so I it was kind you of like You didn't treat a, it in the fall when you put it away, huh? No, I didn't. Aha! Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so that's so, – so we kind of talked about the fuel. Talk a little bit. Let's, you know, let's focus on the gas RX, you know, what, the, what that actually does. You'd kind of explain what it does, but – I will. Um, yeah. So, so stabilizers like uh, Daybell, Startron, Seafoam, those are the biggest names out there. Everybody has used stabilizers forever. And think of the name, it's a stabilizer. So if you, if you fill up your, uh, your, fuel, your, your car or a gas can, you smell those vapors, right? Those vapors are really blowing out of that nozzle, and it's strong. So gasoline vaporizes, right? It has aromatics. Aromatics are really what happens when you have gas that just sits there for a long period of time. Those vapors will vaporize into the atmosphere, and eventually, over a period of time, that gasoline thickens and turns into varnish. Right? It'll it'll harden into things. So, stabilizers will actually 
put a coating over the top of that gasoline to slow that process down. So, you know, and again, it used to be that that gasoline was more stabilized. It would, it, it would last a lot longer. So if you took a can of gas and you put it in your shed, it'd probably be okay up to a year, right? So, but I took gasoline, E10 gasoline and non-ethanol gas, because in our area, we can get non-ethanol gas. I sent both of them to be tested at the refinery, just from NOCO, just, but it doesn't matter. It's anybody's gas. The gas, they do a simulated test, ASTM test, American testing uh, method, standard method, AS, American standard testing method. So they can do a simulated test for up to a year and a half. So after 30 days, they said both gasolines could have runnability issues in your vehicle. After 60 days, they said possible, um, oh, I'm sorry. So 30 days went from A to B grade gas. That's what it was. In 60 days, runnability issues, and 90 days, possible engine failure on two strokes. So what was happening is that stuff is the aromatics are, are uh, escaping much easier. Uh, your water concentration can get in. Like you were saying, when you, you have temperature swings on the buses, um, all you need is seven degrees worth of temperature change for condensation to start. Water droplets get into the fuel, ethanol, it falls to the bottom. That, those droplets of water, they can't fit through the injectors right. So until that engine warms up, cold fuel doesn't hold as much water as hot fuel. So you'll have water laying at the bottom of that fuel rail, and it can't get through the injectors properly. Big globs of water are trying to, and water doesn't burn, right? So now we have misfires on random cylinders. As that fuel heats up, it absorbs some of that water back up into the fuel, and it'll run better. Now, when it goes cold again, it'll fall back out and you've got a problem. If you treat, we break down water as a chemistry, uh, that won't happen at all. Or like you saw in your string trimmer or other engines, I've poured that in with water concentration and it immediately breaks that down. So stabilizers will stabilize that gasoline, keep the aromatics in and help that to last longer. And remember, as it starts to evaporate, you get varnishes. Varnishes harden into small carburetors and plug those little tiny holes and jets in the carburetors. Um, so cleaners are important. So the typical Stabil Startron seafoams are great cleaners, great stabilizers, and they even put in lubricants because some of the gaskets and O-rings dry out. So we want to protect that. That's the standard. That's what you buy when you walk in and grab a stabilizer off the shelf. All right? What we do, we do all that. We do all that. What we do that they don't do is we chemically break water down and we fight the ethanol problem. We fight stability issues of phase separation. We can reverse phase separation, which refineries say you can't do. And I've done it for years. All right. We, uh, my first time we fixed the tank, I think it was 2012. So it's been a while. It's been 10 years we've been fixing uh, ethanol issues. Um, I even accidentally poured four ounces of water into my own car. <laughs> Um, our chemist, our, uh, our additive is clear and our chemist was playing around with dyeing it a green color. So they gave me five bottles and said, Hey, this is all additive. Just use it in your car. Get rid of it. We're just checking stability and if the, if the color will fall out or stay stable. So they didn't tell me that one of the bottles was water. So I had, I was, I poured four ounces into my car. Well, next thing you know, the engine's just misfiring and banging and I've got a, test tool and the check engine light comes on. I plug it in, lean code, both bank. So I'm like, well, that's a classic phase separated ethanol problem. Um, and I smelled the, you know, the container and obviously the chemical has a chemical smell. It smelled like nothing. It was water. Interesting. So I immediately took eight ounces of gas RX, poured it right into the 10 gallons of gas I had in the car. And five minutes later, the misfire went away. The engines run great. I drove it around. The light went off. Never had a problem. Hmm. So that's the difference. You take Stabil, Startron, <laughs> Seafoam, pour it into a water issue, not going to solve the problem. I was at trade shows. I went up with a with a you know a plain shirt on and walked up to uh, Startron's booth. It says you fix water issues. I said, what if it what if it's phase separated? What if you have a ton of water that, gets, that comes in? He goes, oh no no, got to throw that gas away and then treat it so it prevents it from happening. So we don't have to do that. In fact, you talked about the uh, uh, walleye association. 
Remember we were there at the yep. booth together. Yep. One guy came up and said, uh, Hey, I got your stuff at the last meeting. And there was a guy out on the lake that is, was stalled out. He was waiting for a tow. He said, uh, he, he called his engine wouldn't run. He had just filled up, he got five miles out on Lake Erie engine died. He said he could get it running for just maybe three or four minutes at idle and he couldn't go up on plane at all. So he's waiting for the tow boat. So the guy said, I remembered what you said. He said, I gave him an eight ounce bottle of gas RX. And I, I said, you sure you don't want me to tow you? He's like, no, the guy will be here any minute. He said that he got a call from the guy later because he knew, I guess they changed numbers, but he said, uh, I poured that eight ounce bottle in within five minutes, my motor was running and I, I motored all the way back to shore. Huh. So like, those are the difference. We're getting into uh, Bass Pro now because I gave out a ton of product in Florida. Same stuff. People stuck out on the ocean, poured it in. But the idea is use it all the time and you won't have that problem. Yeah. Um, Iroquois Schools was having runnability issues with their buses. They're treating every gas RX. They're putting a gallon for every thousand gallons of gasoline and it's fixing their issues. They don't, they're, they're, they're sold now. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the hardest things I find Be- I'm, I'm very, actually, I'm frustrated with myself that I did not, I have not talked to you about this as it pertains to uh, my gas buying customers, because I really think as we're talking through this problem, I think that this could be, it could likely be what the problem is. They've got phase separated gas and it's sporadic. And that's, what's interesting about it is that, you know, like I'll have a customer say to me, I'm having runnability issues. Like I'm, and it's that it's the fuel trim and the bank one, bank two. So the, so to me, my understanding mm-hmm. of that is, is that the engine is sensing that it's not getting enough fuel. So it's essentially flooding itself out, but that's probably because there's moisture in the fuel and it's not getting enough fuel because the moisture's it's plugging up the, the fuel rails and the injectors. So right. that's where my mind is, is thinking about it. So I, I understand what the issue was they were having, but I wasn't thinking about, you know, you ask them, is your fuel okay? And they're like, well, yeah, it's, we haven't changed anything with our fuel. We're getting it from the same person, but it's sporadic. You know, I can go from district A to district B and they're not having an issue at district A, but I go to district B and they tell me my buses are running like crap and, and this is your fault. And we're sitting there looking and, you know, we're doing everything we can through, through the engine manufacturer, trying to understand what could be the problem. But it's a very localized thing. You could have, you could have a uh, a fuel provider today bring you fuel and it's fine, and then you could have a fuel provider tomorrow bring you fuel and it's contaminated. It's got moisture in it, or you know you might have a leak in your tank at HFL. Might have a leak in their tank and not realize it, and that's a problem that's unique to them. It's not a fuel provider problem. It's not a an engine manufacturer problem. It's a problem they have with their tank. So. That's fascinating. And then, and then if you have, so you said like if you have seven degrees, I think you said uh, six or seven degree drop in temperature, that's what can cause condensation. Do you, uh, like if that can still cause condensation in like a closed loop system? So you've got a, yeah. okay. So you've got like, a, you have a well, fuel tank and a fuel system that's sealed. Uh, you can have that still happen. Well, see, the biggest issue is, it, you know, once it's in the bus or in a vehicle, in your car, it's a sealed system, right? That's why you get gas cap lights. If you, you leave your gas cap off, it's important. They actually have check, check engine lights or, that tell you to put your gas cap back on uh, because it's that important to keep that as a sealed system. So stability is a little better than that. Uh, but all of our small engines are wide open, right? So as the, as, and, and more importantly, you have to realize that that fuel, that gasoline comes out of the pipeline and it goes to someone's storage tank. Then it gets put in a truck. That truck takes it, may take it to another storage tank, which then goes into a truck and then gets to you. So somewhere down the line, they're opening up a, to fill that, that truck up. It could be raining. It could be a really, really wet, moist day. You've seen those mornings where it's just thick or it's, it's drizzly out. Yeah. All of that can get into your fuel. That alcohol really absorbs. It's literally looking for the water, and it wants to suck it in and grab onto it. Um, so you could get up to that threshold of phase separation, uh, and that's this tremendous amount of water in the fuel. So it changes the chemistry of the fuel to not want it to burn as efficiently as it should. Mm. Um, it's a big problem. And now take it out of our cars and buses and trucks and think about all your ATVs and boats. And, you know, if you're floating a boat at your dock and, you know, you're not there for two weeks, the boat is heating up on a hot day. 
And of course, when does it cool off? It cools off at nighttime. Moisture is really, you know, you get a moist, cool night. Well, what do you think happens? That boat's cooling off. When, when things heat up, they expand. And when they cool, they contract. Well, that fuel in the tank is expanding and pushing air out. And then when it cools, it sucks in whatever's around it. It'll suck in moisture, sucks in bacteria, it sucks in whatever's in the air at that point. Pollen can come in, whatever, whatever's in the air, it'll, it'll suck it into the tank. So now you've got that floating around in there. You get debris. That's why fuel filters are important. Water separators are important. Um, our product will correct all of these issues. And I know it sounds like it's snake oil. And, it, you know, hey, I'm the king of the snake oil sales, right? That's what it is. <laughs> right. I've admitted it. I always tell people I never grew up to be a snake oil salesman. That wasn't my dream at 13, 14 years old. But when you find something that actually works, that a customer can pour in and see a difference. Now, how many times have you used an additive? I don't know. I put stable in. I put Startron in. I don't know if it works or not, but I'm supposed to do it. And people do it just in the winter to store it for the winter time, or just in the spring. If you have a snow blower, you're going to store it for the spring, right? That transition is when sales spike. But people are seeing issues, and then they blame the manufacturer. Well, when when all the DPF stuff came out on diesel engines, everybody thought, oh, man, that international engine's a hunk of junk. Now that, oh, well, I switched to Cummins. Well, the Cummins engine's a hunk of junk. Well, I switched to, you know, it's anything with a DPF. The DPF was the problem, not the engine. It's exactly what's going on right now. It's the fuel that's the problem, not the engine. Hmm. And, and the DPF is causes, doing the same thing that the catalytic converter is doing. It's, it's capturing correct. that excess exhaust or fuel and burning it so that you have less right. pollutants coming out the tailpipe. Yep. Yeah. Now, the other part of this product is it's a surfactant, right? So the surfactants lower surface tension, surface tension. So we can get that fuel to atomize uh, more easily and get a more complete burn. So we get a little better fuel economy. We get a much smoother running engine. My daughter won't run. She calls me all the time and says, send me two ounces of gas RX, a little two ounce bottle. She's got a Honda Civic at a traffic light. The engine shakes and sh shimmies. She pours two ounces in, no shake and shimmy. Um, so that's the thing. Billy, to, to your point, my biggest issue is trying to get people to try it. Just try it. Put me in your hardest running, roughest situation. Got a guy with a race car. He's like, oh, it's a high performance, you know, race car, and I got to rebuild the carburetors because it's just running terrible. I said, pour eight ounces and you can't over treat. He said, but it's my race car. I'm like, yeah, so what? It burns gas. Pour it in. He called me back. He goes, holy cow. It's like half an hour later, it was running smooth. So, you know, it's not a miracle. It fixes gasoline issues and cleans out any clogs so it's worth a try if you have a rough running engine before changing parts that's my biggest problem is i talk to a mechanic who's trained and all they've done for 30 years is change parts yep the hardest part for me is to say look look for the root cause of this problem and then treat the root cause and you won't have to change the part right yep so so that's what we're looking to do instead of taking you know, heart medicine. We're getting people to try not to eat chicken wings and drink beer all day. All right. Yeah, Let's that's what's eat causing better it. food right. and stop clogging your arteries. Okay. And they just don't get it. They'd rather just take the pill. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a very yeah. good point. And, and that's, that's something I've heard time and time again in, in the trainings I've sat in on, on the mechanical and for diesel in particular is, you know, if you have a failure at the DPF, on these newer diesel engines, it's likely that there was a, a, a failure upstream that then went downstream to fail the DPF. It wasn't the DPF that failed. It was something upstream. So whether it be a turbo or an injector, a high pressure fuel pump, something failed and you maybe got coolant blow by, or you got something that got into the, into the DPF to cause those problems. But that's, that's really fascinating. I, I this is great. How many times have you and I spoken and done this stuff? Like, you've got my undivided attention and I'm like locked in on this <laughs> because, and this is great. Like I think that people will take a lot of value from this because this is everyday stuff. This isn't just if you drive a school bus, this isn't just if you, you know, have a four wheeler, this is everything. I mean, everybody has a vehicle or an engine of some sort that runs on gasoline. Um, mm -hmm. So we kind of, we kind of covered the gasoline end of it. I'd like to dive into diesel now because it's a little bit of a different beast, similar, but different, but actually before we go to that, um, 
so like two cycle. So, you know, two cycle, you're mixing oil with, mm. so if you got chainsaw or weed eater that runs on two cycle, you, you know, you, I have a can and you have that, to, what, uh, two and a half gallon can and you mix mm-hmm. it with the, you know, I got the little pre-measured, uh, Husqvarna right. oil, 40 to one, 50 dump, to one, right, right. Dump it in. So can you treat that already mixed fuel or should you treat the fuel before you mix it? I guess that's something I'm thinking you about. Treat it either way. Okay. Um, you know, it doesn't matter. You could pour it in after you've had it mixed already. You could pour it in before. It really doesn't matter, but it's important to put it in because now what happens, they separated ethanol. When that water falls to the bottom, pulls the ethanol out with it, that ethanol and water concentration will eat copper, bronze, brass, aluminum. It'll eat fuel line. It eats gaskets and O-rings. It eats everything. It's wildly corrosive in that concentration. It'll wash cylinder walls down. So on two-stroke, the idea is, Let's not have oil in a crankcase that lubricates cylinder walls. We put oil in the gasoline. So as the end piston's going up and down, the cylinder walls are getting lubricated by the gas and oil mixture. Um, As the water concentration goes up and phase separation starts to happen, or even just high concentrations of water will will rinse those cylinder walls down and and really cause problems. We've had construction companies with two-stroke cement cut saws uh, campers, um, they, they melt motors, they melt cylinders all the time. Hmm. Uh, I went into, uh, Roddy construction and they were saying, yeah, two out of the five that I have are melted cylinders. It's a horrible problem. Um, and all it is is get the water broken down and you won't have that problem again. We're the only authorized fuel additive for, um, United Rentals North America because of that problem. We sell a ton of product to them. Uh, just a great company to work with. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just a big problem out there. So to prevent that problem is a big deal. What I want to say to all your listeners, and I certainly would love you to use our product, don't get me wrong, but really make sure your fuel is fresh. Don't let it sit. It's not what it, what it used to be. Make sure you stabilize or treat that fuel no matter what. You really need to. And even if you don't use mine, do yourself a favor and just don't, you know, try not to be that guy. All right. You're going to have a problem. And people say, well, I don't have that problem. I haven't had any problems in a while. Yeah. Well, you're shortening the life of your engine. All right. You're shortening the life of everything you have. You will have issues. Um, so, so treat is important. On to, uh, on to diesel. Um, diesel has a lot of issues. All right. We need more cetane. We need more lubricity. Uh, we don't need all that water. It's a huge problem in diesel as well. Diesel can hold up to two gallons per thousand before it starts to fall out. So that is an, enough to cause corrosion. And it's particularly in a diesel engine, all the fuel pumps, everything's lubricated by the fuel. There's a lot of lubrication in the fuel itself. Um, so when you have water concentration, it causes corrosion and causes a lot of problems in pumps, um, a lot of problems in those engines. Burning dirty. Obviously, you've seen a dump truck, uh, you know, in the morning or a school bus fires up in the morning. The old school ones before DPS used to put tons of soot in, into the air till they warm up. A cold running, an idling or a cold running diesel is a soot creating monster. That's still happening. 60% of DPF clogging happens on startup. Um, DPF is a diesel particulate filter. All right. It's particulate, it's soot, it's particles that it's catching. It's not the NOx or greenhouse gases. That's a separate system. Uh, EPFs are designed to catch all that soot so we don't see it or smell it. So it's just unburned fuel. So as you drive your truck down the road or your school bus down the road, anything diesel operated, even engines uh, as low as 46 horsepower, anything 46 horsepower and above need a DPF now. Um, and they're actually pushing that lower. Mm-hmm. Um, so generators, you they'll, they'll be 44 horsepower now, so you don't have to deal with it. So it's a pretty big problem out there. Um, and again, we boost everything that you need in one bottle that's going to bring it up to a premium diesel fuel and allow that fuel to burn more efficiently. And we've got school systems like Lancaster schools. Greg over there he's got over 100 school buses. He's never taken a DPF off. Really? Yeah, I, I can't say in all my times of working with them and in the parts department, I, I can't say I've ever had a discussion with Greg about 
after treatment ever. Yeah. 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 I, I was over there and I was telling him I wanted to test out this new DPF cleaner that I had. I said, you know, obviously Max Force is known to be a tough engine on that kind of stuff. They did an advanced EGR instead of doing SDR systems and diesel exhaust fluids. So just design wise, it's a clogger. Yeah. Um, he had an, I think a 10 or 11 year old bus with 170,000 on it. He brought it in and after an active regen, um, it was clogged 17%. Now, he's used complete fuel treatment, our diesel side. He's used that product for 15 years. Every single drop of fuel has been treated, every single drop. He doesn't have EGR issues, doesn't have turbo issues, doesn't have DPF clogging. He just doesn't have those issues. So he actually said, he goes, you know, they, they say after uh, 10 years or, you know, 150,000 miles, I should pull that off and have it clean. I'm like, Go pull, why would you pull it off? You're going to sell it in 12 years. You know, you're going to sell it next year. Just leave it. Yeah. You know, don't mess with it. So, um, so anyway, so getting it to burn more efficiently is a big deal. So that's also, we've, we've got fleets all over that treat year round now because of that. Uh, I'm in 60 different international truck dealerships right now because we fix those problems. So we're trying to get out there and tell people again, have a better fuel, you have a better burning engine, you have a cleaner engine, you have less failure. Um, you could add into diesel issues biodiesel. Biodiesel collects 10 times the amount of water. It's a big problem. So in the summertime, they put in up to 10% biodiesel into, into diesel fuel. And in the wintertime, uh, it's maybe 3%. But you, the federal government's pushing the refineries to make a renewable fuel. Mm -hmm. So they have to, by percentage, no matter how much, how many millions of gallons of fuel they manufacture in petroleum, they have to have a renewable in there. So they said you can put in up to 5% biodiesel and not tell anybody. All right. So it can be uh, animal fats or vegetable oils. Um, it can be, uh, there's, there's a lot that goes into fuel. So that, that bio, the, yeah, I'm here. I, oh, yeah. I think, uh, because we didn't go live, I think the Bullhorn website's kicking us off. So whatever, yeah. but I can I can You're hear you loud and clear. Yeah. So I'm just going to close out of that because we don't need it. Um, the uh, biodiesel is something that I'm I, I'm hearing a lot about, and obviously with everything progressing with the with the kind of trying to move away from fossil fuels, especially here in New York, um, mm -hmm. looking at alternative fuels. You know, biodiesel is considered an alternative fuel. Um, do you are is that something that you are seeing people selecting to use biofuel for those reasons, or are people are people getting like at okay? Let's answer that first. Are you seeing people selecting biodiesel as their fuel of choice, and then are they having to treat that? I guess it's mostly political. All right. So um, back when it first came out, it was a, you know biodiesel was a political hot button. So if someone wants to get elected. They go up and say, you know, hey, we're we're going green. So that term has been around for some time now. Mm -hmm. We're going to go green. So we're going to mandate biodiesel in our in our all of our municipalities throughout the state, and that gets some good votes from from anybody who wants it, that green is important to them. Yep. And they put in B twenty, twenty percent biodiesel, eighty percent diesel, um, and depending on the base stock of that diesel, that can be bad or worse. <laughs> there's really no good involved in it. When you use biodiesel as a vegetable oil-based biodiesel, so you've got biodiesel in the kitchen, all right? You've got uh, olive oil and vegetable oil up in your cupboard. Okay. That can be that can be burned in a diesel. You know, a refined version of that can be burned in your diesel engine, right? Mm -hmm. If you cook bacon on a weekend and you pour that off into a coffee cup, um, you can refine that animal fat to be used as a biodiesel. Um, that thick, gray, coagulated stuff on a cool cup of bacon grease, that's gelled biodiesel. Hmm. Uh, it's pretty wild. So it'll gel at 60, 70 degrees, right? Um, that's a big problem for diesels. So you can, uh, vegetable oil base can be soy based. It can be uh, a variety of different types of plant materials. Or you can have uh, fatty acid methyl esters, it's called, which is fats 
So you can have pork fat, beef tallow, you can have uh, chicken fat. There was an issue where there was the Northeast was hit with chicken fat that fell out. I mean, even at 3%, you think about that, you say, well, 3% can't be that much. It's got to be all right. Well, in the wintertime, if you had three gallons in a 100-gallon fuel tank, three gallons of that gelled pork fat, you think that would clog a filter? Oh, that would certainly clog a filter in a heartbeat. And that's what happens. It gels and falls out. Um, biodiesel has less BTUs. Biodiesel holds 10 times the amount of water uh, than, than regular diesel. And it causes more bacterial growth. It actually goes rancid. And in B100, there's rancidity meters, right? You can see if, you're, if your fuel spoils like milk. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so you grow a lot more. You can grow bacteria like crazy in biodiesel blend. Interesting. So uh, you've seen guys that are, you know, there's a, there's chemistries that you have to mix in there to refine it and really pull out good pure diesel out of it uh, or, or biodiesel out, out of, uh, you know, like fryer oil. Some people do that because it's sort of like free fuel, right. you know. But that stuff will gel up at 40 degrees. I had that with New York State DOT. It was... Uh, it was above 35 degrees. It was maybe 37 degrees. And I was down along 86. And there was a, a residency in Mayville and another one uh, maybe near Climber. I can't remember. It was down just down the 86 highway corridor just a little bit. One wouldn't run any engines at all. The other one was running perfectly fine. Hmm. Now, the, the uh, bid came out for fuel. It said in bold, no biodiesel for the winter, period, none. Well, one was 4.6% vegetable oil. The other one, 4.8% pork fat. So which one do you think didn't run right? Yeah. Right. Old pork, pork fat, fat shut the whole fleet down. Amazing. Right. Okay. So you need to, li- and you need to liquefy it. So I had a, I have a product called Thaw It that'll liquefy that. What's um, it called? So there's a, Thaw It. Thaw It. D-H- okay. Yep. A-W. Yep. Thaw It. We want to thaw it out. Um, so there's so much involved in the fuel now. I mean, you just have no idea what's in your fuel. It used to be, you know, diesel was diesel, gas was gas. Don't worry about it. Now we don't know what anything is. It's, it's mixed in different percentages, different base stocks. We don't we don't know. And and who knows uh, how long it'll stay stable? Who knows how long it's been around? Uh, the bottom of these fuel tanks at a lot of gas stations, especially ones that are not used frequently, like the busier gas stations and fuel stations. They, they churn fuel so those tanks are a little cleaner. I see just nightmare problems when I sample the bottom of those tanks. Yeah. So the fact of, you know, you've heard the old tale of, you know, don't fill up if, the, if you have the big tanker there filling the tank. That's true. All right. And if you go, uh, speaking on the gasoline side, if you ever fill up and, and, the, and it's coming out really, really, really slow, and you're like, what's taking so long? Why is this coming out of the handle slow? Leave. Um, you've got water concentration. The filter is locked up and trying not to give you the bad gas. Hmm. All right. Interesting. So, yeah. so on on, so, the, on the diesel front, essentially, your your the, the name of your diesel product is what? Complete, Complete. fuel treatment. Okay. So that you're yeah. you're doing your it's exactly the same exercise as what you're doing with gasoline. You're just doing it with diesel, correct? Right. We're removing water. We're we're there's Tremendous amounts of deposits that happen in those injectors. So what they're trying to and 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 deep lubricity and seating improvers. So we have all of that in that complete fuel treatment. And then we have cold flow improvers that prevent gelling. Quick gelling is paraffin wax that thickens and falls out of the fuel. The the energy in the diesel fuel is paraffin wax. It's like candle wax. It's liquefied in there. Mm-hmm. So the higher it has higher BTUs because of that content. So more power in the fuel, more heat, more thermal energy uh, that can push those big cylinders up and down and move, haul heavy things. Uh, but that paraffin wax, when it gets cold, can thicken. It, it sticks together. Those crystals grow, and it falls to the bottom and sticks in your filter. So we coat those wax crystals with a chemical that's like a Teflon coating kind of thing where it doesn't allow them to stick together or grow, and we can lower that temperature down to minus 40 to 45 degrees um most of our competitors out there the power service and house and those they may drop five to ten degrees something like that our products drop 30 to 40 degrees so in a single treatment so we go really heavy because we're dealing with fleet 
you want trucks to run. Sometimes right. you could fill up a, a heavy truck in, uh, you know, New York or, or, uh, yeah, Connecticut somewhere. They fill up and, uh, in, in January and then they drive up to northern Maine where it goes down to minus 45 degrees well they need coverage for that so yep. we, we help them out so I've I've seen uh, I, I had reached out to you back in in uh, July I think I'd seen a, a friend of mine had put a post up on on Facebook about just kind of asking if people had seen decreases in their performance on their uh, for on their diesel pickup trucks uh, uh-huh. in the let the, the fuel economy kind of dropping out and appearing that there's something has changed uh, in, in the last, you know, like, let's just say in the last six to eight months, has there been, have you seen kind of consistent changes, especially on the diesel fuel end, as far as the quality of the fuel and, and would that affect your, your fuel mileage? So the fuel mileage issue, um, fuel mileage issue is typically seasonal, uh, fuel changes from summer to fall. Now think about that. You know, if you want to fill up at your local gas station, um, with diesel, if you fill up in June, you don't have to worry about gelling, right? If you fill up in the middle of December or January, you have a problem because you're going to gel up, right? So they remove some of that that paraffin wax. So they'll blend kerosene in with that or they'll use additives. So you'll see a change dramatically from the summer to fall. You'll see miles per gallon drop off. I mean, I used to have a, you might see, Depending on the miles per gallon you get in the vehicle, you might see a three or four mile per gallon drop hmm. just because of the season change. And it happens right about now, maybe uh, September, October, we start to get into a change of fuel over to a winter blend. Winter blend, okay. Um, yeah, so so number two is, is diesel. They call it number two fuel. Number two diesel could gel at plus five or plus 10 degrees, all right, in the summertime. Kerosene is number one diesel. And all it is is diesel fuel without the paraffin wax. It gels below minus 55. Okay. So they'll blend a little bit of kerosene in with the regular diesel fuel, and it disperses the wax and lowers the gel point. Every They say that every 10% lowers the gelling by 5 degrees. So typically, you're going to be in the minus 10 to minus 15. Uh, but if you get a bad blend of fuel, I mean, so some of your customers, Billy, might have a, a bus that's sitting in the yard that they didn't use since, july it's their spare and they pull it out in january and it's got summer fuel in it it's gonna be a problem Mm -hmm. might gel up might not start Hmm. um like we all gelled up um construction companies have these problems all the time and i would have to but yeah you i would have to assume that uh that you know with today's modern engines they're they're running on so much tighter you know uh they have to be at higher pressures for the fuel. The, the constraints are so much tighter in order to meet emissions that it's probably even more finicky than it, than it has ever been uh, with right. the engines. They need they need the fuel to be at a certain degree of of combination of where it needs to be. The, the chemistry needs to be right in order for it to burn properly. And uh, correct, yeah, th- yeah. My I've yeah, got so I've got, I've got a whole list of people that I. <laughs> that I've had conversations with that I know have had problems historically buses that we, you know, we've taken on trade that have been sitting in the parking lot for months and Mm -hmm. you get them, you you know, the, the the customers taking them off the road and we go to pick them up and you leave the parking lot and the check engine light comes on and it's something to do with the fuel system. Uh, you know, often it's the high pressure fuel pump. It's, I mean, that's almost the most, that's basically the most common problem that we see on an older vehicle. That's not getting run very often. It's the high pressure fuel pump. Um, can you treat? Can and you- they're pumping they're they're pumping that pressure up really high. Oh, I mean, they're up high, to yeah. 30, 40,000 psi. It's crazy. So the idea behind that is to atomize the. If you atomize the fuel, think of fuel as a drop, right? If you had a basketball sized drop of fuel and you tried to burn it, you're going to burn it from the outer, you know, the outside layer toward the center. You've got a mill, a couple of milliseconds for that fuel to burn before the piston's gone to the next stroke, right? So. Uh, if you took that basketball size drop of fuel, it takes time to burn right through to the center. If you took that and you increased the pressure and you squirt it through a, a small opening, like like a perfume atomizer almost, right? Now you get droplets that come out. So if you make it baseball size, maybe you'd have 10 baseballs or 20 baseballs. Now you have more surface area. It takes less time to burn to the center of that drop. So the more you increase pressure, and the smaller the pintle tip or the opening is on the end of the injector, the more you're going to make that now into 
you know, golf ball. All right. So we actually have a product in there that chemically lowers surface tension on a droplet. So if you look, think of a drop of water, it's about the same size before it splits off, right? Mm -hmm. Or a soap bubble. You blow a soap bubble and it blows up and it gets to the point where the surface tension is exceeded and it pops. Our chemistry will lower the surface tension so it helps it to atomize. So, so we take those, those golf balls and turn them into marbles. So we're getting a more complete burn. So when we talked about soot clogging a DPF, what is that? Well, it's just unburned fuel that's now getting blown down the exhaust and gets caught. So it's just unburned fuel. It's uh, it's sort of like, you know, charcoal. It looks that same way, that black stuff, right? Mm -hmm. We want to burn that charcoal off. So what if we could get it to burn so efficient that we get all the BTUs out of that fuel or most of it, uh, and we don't have that charcoal stuff left over, well, we're not clogging that DPS as fre frequently. We have customers that'll treat with complete fuel treatment. They'll say, well, we reduce active regens by more than 50%. That's a huge deal. It takes more than a half a gallon of diesel fuel to actively regen a DPS, to burn off that soot, all right? So we're squirting raw fuel down the exhaust to, to clean the trap. Uh, we're losing fuel economy because the fuel's not burning as it should. Um, and so these additives actually pay for themselves. And it's it's the hardest part of my job is to try to convince people that this really will do what it's supposed to do. All we're doing is boosting that fuel to what the refinery should do in the first place. Um, we're making a European grade of diesel fuel by adding all the components back in. All right. So Europe doesn't have a lot of these problems. I mean, they have DPS and SDR, but they don't have rampant issues like we have because um, they have a better grade of fuel. Their their standard is above 50 butane. They have standards, actually, for the amount of water content. There's no water allowed. They have standards for lubricity. They did the right thing. We don't in this country. We say to the engine manufacturers, don't emit anything. Create these engines to run. And, uh, yeah, fuel companies, I guess, as long as it's 40 butane, it's okay. Interesting. So they get they get away with murder. Yeah. Uh, and and we're boosting that product to get it to run the way it should. And uh, and our again, just try it and it works. To your point with the uh, the buses, we have a service kit that's phenomenal. You can pour injector cleaner in the tank and injector cleaner in the filter and run that for forty five minutes at a high idle. It'll clean that any fuel related issues up in forty five minutes. I've had guys that had huge excavators that needed uh, $25,000 worth of injectors and they used a $40 kit and cleaned it right up and then and sold the truck. I mean, that's how I got into New York State DOT. They had three Fords that were going in for service back when I worked with selling Ford parts. Two of the, all three of them were going in for $5,000 worth of injectors each. Two of those trucks, two of the three were a $20 kit. They just cleaned the injectors. Went right back into service. So there's a lot you can do to keep your engines running smooth. And again, treat your engines, feed them the right fuel, clean them up and keep them clean, and you'll have a happy running engine. That's the simple part of it. Yep. You'll have a happier running engine. You'll be a happier person because you're not going to be cursing, thinking that there's something wrong with your brand new pressure washer or your weed eater is not working. You got to go buy a new one. Um, yep. God, it's just, it's like it. And that's the problem with all these things, Ron, and this is the challenge of, of the line of work that you're in with a product like this is that it's like you almost I'm, – I'm sitting here thinking like you almost have to have a – you need to have like a subscription program for people, and maybe you have one, but have a program where people can just get on it and you send them, you know, one gallon a month if that's what the volume yeah. is that they use because for me, oftentimes it's not that I, I, I don't want to continue to use it. It's that I run out of it. Like I've got – Four, right. four of four, or six of them sitting in my cabinet right now. But when they're gone, it's like, ah, I gotta go. I gotta, I gotta get this thing, my truck right. fueled, or my, I gotta get in the side by side and go. I'm just gonna throw gas in it, and then that gas is in there for two months because you don't burn it that quickly, and right. you don't get back around to getting it. So, yeah, that's the that hard is the part. Truth. Yeah. That's the and 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 we've been really uh, busy with fleet and municipal and heavy truck and bulk storage and all that. Uh, so we haven't really gone retail, and we're just starting that now. So we have an opportunity in Florida to get into Bass Pro, and I'm hoping we can now expand that into more retail. Um, 
because people ask, where can I get it? And we have a website called Advanced Fuel Products that you can go on and buy that uh, online and get it shipped to you. Um, and, you know, certainly it, there's been other people uh, that we've been, you and I have been in contact with that are starting to turn on to sell more of this stuff. So, yeah, if there's anybody that's interested in being a distributor or there's anybody listening that has, you had mentioned a, a couple of places where you can go and get hunting gear and equipment. Yeah, outdoor um, we, stores, we, yeah. We'd love to. We'd love to have anybody be a distributor. Um, it's just, it's just getting it out there, doing things like this. Thank you so much for letting me come on the podcast. Uh, just that exposure, it's, uh, it's, it's big. Well, for instance, I, you know, I went to the Shed Fest and ended up hooking up with uh, the Walleye Association, and they've been great. I, I went there, and some a buddy of mine met me there, and he's like, "What are you doing? You got like seven cases of product. What are you? You're creating a store here." Well, I blew through all of it. I know. And then the next week, I blew through all of it again. I mean, I got to get back there again. Um, yeah, I was sitting there selling. Everybody raffle, kept selling raffle tickets that day, and and you you come, come walking <laughs> in, and I let you have a corner of the table with me, and I'm you know, and I use your product, I I know what it is, and so you end up you walked away to go see somebody, and you and you were gone for like forty five <laughs> minutes. Everybody's grabbing you and giving you testimonials, and I'm sitting over there freaking. I couldn't get back to the booth. I'm freaking slinging product. It was like, but. <laughs> But that's that's what it is. I mean, and that's the fun part. Like you and I are both salespeople, and it's there's nothing more fun as a salesperson. You know, my product that I sell is a big giant yellow piece of metal that I sell once a year. Yeah, um, it's a long sales process, but with with something like what you have, it's exciting to be selling something that is you can get that instant gratification as the user, where you buy that product yeah. and you see the improvement in whatever it is that you're running it in it's a, it's, it's fun. Like it, it, and it's a product that I've known you long enough that I wouldn't have somebody on here to, to talk about a product if I didn't believe in it. And I think the listeners of the show know that, that I don't just, you know, I like to try new things. I like to buy products and test them out. But when there's something I really believe in and, and you're a great guy and we've known each other a long time, I want to help elevate you and get you into, you know, more fuel tanks around people that I know. And, uh, and that's what's fun about all this is, you know, I can I can help, you know, boost your voice and uh, and get your stuff out there, too. And I encourage well, people you. to try it because, you know, I'm, th- I'm thinking here, sitting here just thinking about all the different things that we have up at camp. We have our 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 diesel uh, Kubota that, you know, it sits idle a good portion of the year. It just sits there. And you think right. about those sorts of engines that it's maybe it's not your pickup truck or your car that's sitting in the driveway. You're, maybe you're not having issues with that, but. I mean, how often do you have issues with those engines on those vehicles that you don't frequently use? And I think that's an area right. where people, and those are easy ones to treat because you might put a tank of uh, gasoline in your four-wheeler and it might sit at your cabin for a whole year and you might not use more than a tank of fuel. That's easy to treat. Right. Like you just take that, treat it, and you're good. I guess, now here I am going on a wormhole. Like in those situations, would you treat that one time or would that be something that like, if it's been six months and you still have that same fuel in there, should you, I know you said you can't over treat, but would there be a benefit to giving it another shot to like re re establish it itself? Help. It would, it would help. It stabilizes. So gas RX, and we also have gas RX plus, which has a good detergent and it cleans carbon. Uh, that's a better product for that situation, but um, that it'll stabilize ethanol gas for up to two years. So that where I told you about, we sent that fuel in for a test and it was breaking down over 30, 60, 90 days. That same product we had treated and they said it, it was still a grade gas at a year and a half. So they said we could stay up to two years. Nice. So you should treat. And, and to touch on what you were saying, generators are a big issue. Uh, all right. There's yeah. a lot of people that have generators and when the emergency hits and you have a power outage or you're up at camp and you, you know, you don't really use it, but it'll just a little bit here and there. You're not there for six, eight months. You want power. You want your ATV to run. You want your, you, you depend on these pieces of equipment and you don't necessarily go up there and start every engine to make sure that they're running. Okay. You go out when it's, when you need it right now. And that's the most inconvenient thing. So that little bit of preventative just saves so much time. And our products are very cost effective. I mean, for all that they do, we're less than what the other products are out in the market. So you're not, I'm not asking you to spend double the money and buy this high end product. It's not the case. I want customers to have great products at a great price 
and you can't over-treat with the gasoline products. You're not going to have any issues there. You can't run your motor on it, so don't be silly. I did have a guy that put in a, you know, a gallon of product in a 40-gallon tank. I'm like, you can't put a 1,000 gallons of fuel treatment into a 40-gallon tank and expect it to be better, right. right? More is not better. So if it says you could double the treatment, don't put in eight times the amount. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. You're not getting better. Um, but it's important to treat all of it and treat every fuel fill that you have. It, it's, uh, it's just, it's literally pennies. You're talking about a penny and a half a gallon, two pennies a gallon. But think about how the inconvenience, the inconvenience of having something break. Um, and then the repair time, you know, who wants to be out there pulling your arm off, trying to start your mower or start your ATV or start your string trimmer. It's just a hassle. So um, we do get engines to run more efficiently. Uh, cars, small engines, generators. That's exactly how I got into United Rentals. We, we went locally and took a bunch of product. And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody says that. stuff." I said, give me your hardest starting thing. He goes, he was going to throw away the saw. They just, he rebuilt the carburetor twice. He's like, it's not worth it. And he poured gas RX in and had it chugging and banging for a while. And it fixed the problem. He's like, all right, I'm in. So, we just all I want is people just to try it. Now the 800 number on every single bottle of product that we sell. Now we sell two ounce all the way up to 55 gallon drum. Um, the 800 number on every bottle rings to my cell phone as the owner. I want to hear from you. I want to know exactly what you're doing. Help you through any situations. Let you know how much to treat. Um, you're not getting you know a, a message in a machine from some 800 number somewhere. So we're personalized service. You can fix anything from your your string trimmer up to your 20,000 gallon storage tank. Yep. So, and you're right. You're right here. I mean, you're a Buffalo guy and, uh, yep. and your product is made right here in Buffalo as well. Correct. Yeah. We formulate, we mix our own formulas. We buy raw materials from the refinery. We're not using any bathtub gin crazy. <laughs> we made it up somewhere. We, uh, we use, uh, we use what the refineries use. We just use the right amount. I love it. It's been a great chat. I think it's very valuable. And, uh, I appreciate all your support of us and, uh, you know, jumping on shed fest the last couple of years and helping us out there. And, uh, Absolutely. hopefully we'll continue to grow with you. So I love it. Appreciate I love you, it. anything I could do to help Billy. Anytime. All right. So, all right. You go right. enjoy the rest of your day and, uh, everybody out there just keep feeding them. Thank you. All right. See you Ron. Thank you.